I have two simple challenges. One, I'm standing between you and drinks. <laughs> and two, I've got to tell you about the future of cloud in 30 minutes. I promise you I'm not going to speak fast. I'm going to try and pace myself and hopefully get those messages out to you. But before we get into the depths of the presentation, there are three things I wanted to say. One, a recent Gartner CFO survey showed that CFOs want to invest and scale digital across the organization to meet the challenge of the economic headwinds that most organizations are facing. What this means, of course, is that you need a platform to scale and accelerate digital. And guess what that platform is going to be? Cloud. The second thing is, and this is probably a little bit more important thing as well, the days of cheap or con continuous lowering of cloud services costs are over. You'll find that this year and following from next year, the cost, the prices of cloud services will go higher. Now, we all know cost management is a big issue in the cloud, right? So this is another challenge you'll have to manage as you look forward, or you go forward, more or less. And the third thing, which is slightly longer term, is the rate of innovation that the cloud service providers are providing you is far greater than your ability to consume that innovation. So the question is, where is this excess innovation going? You'll find that the cloud service providers are going to use that innovation to drive business innovation in vertical industries. For example, we've already seen Amazon getting into banking. We see Google trying to get into healthcare. So the question is, longer term, you need to ask yourself, what does this mean for my industry? What does this mean for me? So cloud's been with us for 15 plus years. Pesky teenager, you could call, right? Now, the whole idea that when you look at cloud, we've just kind of scratched the surface as far as innovation is concerned, to be honest. What you see are these four phases on the journey to cloud. Most organizations are at phase one or phase two. Phase one is basically cloud trying to disrupt non-cloud environments, technology-wise, your data center, and so on. And the shift in terms of thinking from CapEx to OpEx. Phase two is where new capabilities become available to you, like continuous integration, continuous delivery, serverless APIs, increased automation. Yes, they are possible with other technologies, but economically not viable. Phase three is where cloud starts enabling the platform business model, the widespread adoption of platform business model. And this is where technology starts becoming a fundamental component of your business model. And then phase four is where cloud typically starts, or using cloud, you start disrupting leaders in your markets. And you might say, apart from the digital giants and digital startups, are there other organizations who've done it? The answer is absolutely. Organizations like Moderna, PepsiCo, Rabobank, Government of Estonia have already started disrupting or creating or developing disruptive capabilities using cloud. So the journey of digital uh, transformation and, and capabilities will be underpinned by cloud, whether you're accelerating your business capabilities or you're transforming your business model. So what does the next chapter, and before we get into the predictions, we'll look at what are some of the evolutionary things that are happening in cloud, and then we'll look at some of the implications to you as well. So as it says here, it's kind of the end of the beginning of the initial cloud chapter. Cloud is moving towards providing services where you need them. For example, at the edge or on-premise de uh, deployments. 
Sovereign clouds, industry clouds, are some of the evolution that you'll see happen as far as cloud is concerned. And to be honest, we are seeing a lot of organizations saying that cloud is either indispensable or heavily impactful for their organizations. And that's kind of borne out by looking at the market size. The public cloud forecast, as you can see, is supposed to reach a trillion dollars by 2026. And it exceeds growth in all other IT markets. So what does that beginning look like? And you might say, oh, this suspiciously looks like IS, PaaS, and SaaS. Yes, it does, but it's slightly different. Right at the bottom, you can see the technology core. And what I'm trying to do here, and you'll see, position the current vendors in these segments, and then the implications on you as well before we get to the predictions. So if you look at the bottom layer, it's very truly the whole technology pioneered and heavily influenced clearly by the hypes, uh, hyperscalers. So that's the technology core. On top of that, you have capability enhancement, where they are using the underlying technology core to add new capability. And then finally, of course, the whole value enhancement. And this is where you're looking at players, and I'll talk about those in a minute, who are providing services directly to the end users, but using some of the capabilities that you see here. So if I was to position the various groups of vendors in the market, you, they form this kind of clumps, I would say. Right at the bottom, of course, you have vendors A who provide those base infrastructure services. They could be hyperscalers, they could be a traditional infrastructure services providers and others. B are the one who provide that integrated core infrastructure and platform services. C are the ones who typically try and go across those technology foundations and provide capabilities. We'll look at some of those as well in a minute. And D, you could argue, are truly getting to that platform concept where you're using the capabilities of the capability enhancer to uh, provide additional platform capabilities in terms of innovation and those kind of areas. And E are the ones that I was talking about in terms of who provide services. For example, the knights of uh, Netflix or Peloton, I would put those in this category. They all use underlying uh, cloud capabilities to provide those services. And F is the category where most vendors want to be as well. Whether they are hyperscalers or not, it doesn't really matter. Or whether they are traditional infrastructure software companies or your traditional infrastructure providers that you have within the organization, they clearly want to look at how they can develop capabilities across the entire stack. And of course, the C aspect, when you expand it a bit, you see that the layers of data management that are required across multiple cloud providers, across multiple platforms. So for example, vendors like Snowflake and others are part of that category. You're also looking at Kubernetes, uh, container orchestration applications written for containers in that category as well. And this is kind of where multi-cloud starts to emerge. And I would say there's still a lot of hype around what is multi-cloud and where multi-cloud fits in. And we have a prediction about that. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then, of course, you have operations vendors, like, for example, VMware, who again provide capabilities across those uh, layers and across different players across the whole industry as well. So in terms of cloud, there really is no going back. We knew during the pandemic that uh, a lot of organizations, in fact, I was talking to a large bank and their um, board was having a discussion and almost all of them, you know, at the board, uh, the CEO, CFO, really thought cloud was did the job really, really well during the pandemic. The access to applications worked. They didn't have any problems accessing on-premises applications and so on and so forth. So the CFOs, who are probably the most, the you know, biggest cynics, I suppose, in terms of the whole CapEx to OpEx transformation, were also getting their head around some of those capabilities that cloud provided. And as you can see on the left-hand side, things were clearly, some of the things here were not possible without the cloud. Or 
economically not viable because of um, or, uh, on an on-premise kind of environment. And there are other things that cloud will enable as well that you see on the right-hand side of this chart. Uh, one interesting one to keep your eye on is super apps. The whole combination of 5G, uh, mobile, and cloud, with essentially cloud providing services wherever you need them, is becoming an interesting um, uh, aspect. And you see some of those rollouts in countries like Korea, for example. Uh, they have already developed some super apps, some development in China as well. But that is something from a transformational point of view that you'll see being rolled out as well in our industry. So anything at scale, cloud will be the foundation for that. So here we come. What do we think the future is going to be? What does the future prediction look like? By 2027, more than 70% of customer requirements for cloud native capabilities will be delivered by hyperscale ecosystems. CSP native, cloud service provider native versus container focused. Cloud native is also a very loaded word. We'll be double clicking on this um, SPA or strategic planning assumption in a minute as well. By 2027, 40% of enterprises, multi-cloud expectations will be unachievable. This is more or less an expectation gap as opposed to a technology capability, to be honest. By 2027, led by the deglobalization trend, sovereign cloud will be a critical requirement in less than 15% of enterprise cloud RFPs worldwide. I'm actually seeing sovereign cloud's uh, demand in Asia, some parts in Europe, increase as well. And then 50%, by 2027, 50% of organizations will use industry cloud platforms to accelerate their digital business initiatives up from less than 5% in 2022. We'll double click on some of these uh, in the presentation as well. So when we say cloud native, as an umbrella term, you know, you, if you assume that it has all the cloud characteristics, the way we've defined, for example, at Gartner, you wouldn't be wrong. It, has, it is cloud native. Or if you're planning to use cloud native architectures like LifeSpa, latency sensitive, instrumented, failure aware, all those uh, parts of the acronym, that's fine. That's uh, cloud native too. But where the, the paradox happens is between CSP native, cloud service provider native, versus container focused. And CNCF, cloud native. Uh, computing Foundation, you notice that there's no container in that C, is promoting container focused around Kubernetes. Let me give you a, a stat there. Today, only 5% of your enterprise applications are containerized. 5%. We expect that to go up to 15% in about two years' time. So if you look at the way the cloud service providers are providing APIs, automation, um, integration, assembly, those sort of capabilities are far more uh, adopted by a lot of organizations as compared to something like Kubernetes. I'm not saying it's the wrong thing to do, but it's a hard thing to do. So keep that in mind as you evolve your capabilities. Now, when you start looking at migrating your applications, you see the bottom four, the likes of revise, re-architect, rebuild, and replace, lend themselves really well for cloud native. And the bottom three, in terms of re-architecting, rebuild, and replacing, they lend themselves well for composable applications. And composable applications are where you essentially have components, package-based components, they're called PBCs, where you assemble and integrate applications. Going forward, we are going to see more and more of that. Assembly and integration of applications as opposed to pure development as such. So what about multi-cloud? You know, right at the bottom, we have the definition here, which says multi-cloud computing refers to the use of multiple cloud providers for the same general class of IT solutions. What that means 
is if you're comparing AWS with Azure, then yes, that's multi-cloud. But if you're comparing AWS with Office 365, they're not in the same class of IT solutions. They're different. The point here also being that when you start looking at multi-cloud, there's a maturity in terms of its implementation. Almost every organization will end up with multi-cloud, either by design or by accident. And I've seen quite a few accidents of multi-cloud too. And then as part of that tactical approach, you might say, okay, I do want multi-cloud because there's a certain cost benefit because I'm able to negotiate better for this type of application versus this other. You want to introduce some form of competition and so on. But from there, you're then looking at, if I'm going to end up in a multi-cloud environment, how am I going to manage it? How am I going to monitor it? How am I going to actually make sure that the whole complex workload integration happens as well? And then the stage after that is the whole multi-cloud architecture bit, which is one of the hardest things to do. In terms of portability, you might say, I've written this app for this particular um, environment, and I'm Keep in mind, I'm using CSP native capabilities here, potentially when I'm developing my application. If you use that, then clearly from a portability point of view, it becomes a bit of a challenge. However, there are organizations that we've spoken to who've written highly portable applications. Now, the challenge there really is having those skills and knowledge to be able to implement in that way that it does become portable. And we've got some case studies. If you want to know about those, we can talk about that as well after the presentation. And then, of course, the whole uh, multi-cloud architecture stuff, introducing the whole uh, dynamic provisioning, bursting, and those kind of things, which can potentially become a challenge as well. So when we looked at organizations, we asked the question, you know, how would you categorize tactical accept and leverage? Going forward, clearly the tactical stuff is going to reduce because you'd have rationalized, you've got a good cloud strategy, so you are actually making sure that multi-cloud is more deliberate and it's part of your strategy. The accept part means that you'll have to invest more in the whole management governance aspects, the cost management, and so on and so forth. And the leverage part, which is where you're actually looking at implementing portability and those kind of things, will become harder over a period of time. And hence, you can see some of that reduce over a period of time as well. So if you put all those things together in a big picture, this is probably what it would look like. You have industry clouds right at the top in terms of value enhancement. Then you have sovereign clouds at that technology core level. Two interesting things here. One is that by 2020, between 2025 and 2027, that kind of time frame, the next three to five years, 70% of the applications that you will have in your organization will be low-code, no-code applications. Think about this. Low-code, no-code. Developed by business technologists. We found that 40% of businesses have technologies who understand and are tech-savvy. And they are starting to use low-code, no-code software. Which means, fundamentally, your application environment changes to what I said before assembly and integration. So industry clouds will drive a lot of those package-based component capabilities as well, which you'll see emerge in that time frame too. Sustainability is a given. I'm already seeing in Europe a lot of organizations in the RFPs want to understand sustainability efforts by the vendors and providers of cloud services. So let's look at the implications. This is probably one of the biggest implications on you. Your operating model, your organization structure is definitely going to change. If your CFOs want to accelerate digital in your organization, then the operating model that you have to implement in IT will look very different. Most organizations who start the cloud journey start with a cloud center of excellence, CCOE. Almost every organization I speak to start with that. Great, good first step, you have governance and so on and so forth. Track that journey up the pyramid now. 
what do you need after Cloud Center of Excellence? You need to be able to use the APIs, the automation capabilities that cloud providers provide in a way that gives you that additional capability. And that's where platform engineering platform teams start to emerge. These platform teams provide APIs for, for example, for DevOps team and product teams that you have within your organization. The stage after that is the business fusion teams that I was talking about. The business technologies will be developing a lot of capability using low-code, no-code. IT needs to work with the business to form these business fusion teams to evolve the cloud implementation to the next level. And the last stage is where you truly become a digital product organization where you have multiple digital products that you've launched. But you need communities of practice that go across all those products. This is probably one of the biggest questions we get or I get from a lot of clients because they really want to know how their operating models will change as they start implementing cloud. So this is one of those areas that will absolutely be necessary to evolve as your cloud adoption increases within your organization. Now, you can't have a cloud discussion without cloud security, right? 2014, 20, no, no, 14, 15, uh, almost the discussion was, um, uh, if you're trying to do cloud, don't do it because security is not secure. Right? That was kind of, the security says no was the kind of answer to every cloud question in 2014, 2015. Today, I think most organizations realize that cloud computing is more secure than on-premise computing. Cloud providers have more money to spend than any organization does. The point here as well is, if there are any mistakes, if there are any faults, they will be driven mostly by you. So most security incidents are gonna be your fault because of bad configuration, not using the right APIs, misconfiguring the application, and so on and so forth. And by 2027, cloud computing will just be accepted. In fact, there are two things that are going to happen there. One is the whole security and network inversion. So technologies like SASE, Secure Access Services Edge, where you can take security to the sessions, the cloud sessions directly, instead of bringing all your sessions together and applying security to it. We've got a lot of research on that. So that technology is going to mature by 2027, and you're going to be using that much more. Second, you're going to be bringing security very much forward or back in the whole development process through DevSecOps and building tool, tool chains where policy as code, security becomes part of that automated tool chain that you're building as well. So those are the couple of other evolutions that you'll see happen. And your journey into cloud will clearly follow these four paths that we see. And it'll vary. You know, some of you might say, okay, I'm still in the you know, replacement journey, phase one, that's fine, nothing wrong. You could um, you know, evolve your organization to uh, make sure that the technology replacement journey works well. Or you might be at the business transformation uh, end in terms of how you transform your journey. Now, the key thing here, of course, is to have that business, uh, not just business, but IT strategy. In fact, not even IT strategy, a cloud strategy. And we think that business strategy and cloud strategy will be inseparable as you go up that pyramid. I've had a number of conversations today with you who are, you know, who are asking me about what sort of strategy should I have in place? How do I convince the board? What, what are some of the things that are going to work? Of course, many of you have adopted cloud for years. I know that. But now, and it's, by the way, never too late to talk about strategy, never too late to build a strategy that enables you to transform that business model as you go up on that journey. So strategy is going to be key. Now, accelerators and inhibitors. We talked a lot about the accelerator. The two big things to watch out here from an inhibitor's point of view, one, insufficient skills. And we heard that in the keynote this morning as well. Let me give you an interesting statistic. We have an uh, application in Gartner called Talent Neuron. 
where we look at job postings of various uh, areas and skills across the globe. To just give you a data point, there are more than 200,000 job postings open for automation today. That is 10 times more than the combined job postings for things like ITIL or IT service management. So skills gaps are going to be key. Don't forget, the business technologies can help here as well. So part of the business fusion stuff or the fusion teams that we are talking about can help plug some of those gaps too. But this is going to be fundamentally a, a, a thing that you need to be clearly watching out for. Deglobalization is certainly because of supply chain disruptions, because of COVID disruptions and so on and so forth. Many countries clearly are looking at how we can build our own sovereign clouds. So that's something that we are seeing also. So in terms of if you were to look at what are some of the competencies that you need to keep in-house, these are the four competencies I would probably suggest keeping in-house. Strategy. You obviously cannot outsource the strategy. Architecture. You need to think about how you're going to architect the solutions for your business. Security, of course, something that you really need to own and develop in your organization. And then sourcing. Keep in mind that as you start this journey in the next chapter, sourcing is going to be a bit more difficult because it's not going to be simple where you'll say, I've chosen my cloud provider, I don't need to worry uh, about anything else. Given the evolution that we talked about, cloud provider selection, deployment is going to be a bit more complex than what we know today. And what is the impact on various IT leaders in different roles within your organization? For applications, for example, application leaders, we touched on this before. Challenging that new monolithic architecture is going to be absolutely critical. And the whole aspect of assembly and integration of applications is going to be something that application development teams will have to do. Picking another one, infrastructure and operations. That's where the whole platform team concept that I mentioned becomes important. Platform engineering and building those platform teams is going to be critical for a lot of organizations. And then if you pick something like security and risk, for example, we talked about the whole network and security inversion where technologies like Secure Access Services Edge, SASE, um, whole DevSecOps in terms of building policy as code practices becomes critical for you as an organization. So by 2027, you will be known for the innovation you provide as opposed to the information technology that you implement. The future of technology is cloudy, future of cloud is business innovation. I'm giving you a minute back for your drinks. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.